all for coming, and thank you, Dad Smith Institute, for inviting me. And it's it's great to see a full house uh, tonight. Um, so I've been asked to talk about how to be a rational egoist, but I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about why you should care about being a rational egoist. And I think, and I'm going to make an assumption, and I hope the assumption is true. And, and the assumption is that in this group. We all care about freedom, we all care about free markets, we all care about capitalism. And, and you know, we, many of us, are advocates of free markets and capitalism. And I'm going to make an assumption that we all can agree that those things are good. And I would argue, and Ayn Rand has argued, that if we really believe, you know, I never turned this on. Do I need it? Do I need a mic? No. no. no I think this is cl cleaner, cleaner sound without the mic. Uh, um, let me know in the back if, if I needed to switch it on. Ayn Rand would argue that we are losing the battle for free markets, at least uh, in the West, uh, that we have been losing this battle uh, for the last hundred or so years, in spite of the fact that we have the best economists, in spite of the fact that we have reality on our side, when capitalism free markets are tested, they work, when they're tried, it creates <coughs> prosperity and, and a good life. In spite of all the evidence, in spite of all the facts, in spite of the great economists that we have, we're losing the battle because, because the underlying morality, the underlying ethical beliefs of the culture are antagonistic to capitalism. Markets are about what? Markets are about profit. But they're not just the, on the business side, they're about profit. On the consumer side, they're about what? Fulfilling our interests, our values. Go, you know, going out and buying a... I, I like to joke that I, I went and bought an iPhone uh, in order to stimulate the U.S. economy. That was my primary <laughs> reason. And I'm sure most of you go shopping in order to help the shopkeeper. And to, you know, Adam Smith got this right a long, long time ago. Well, we're all in it for ourselves in the marketplace. The marketplace is about self-interest. And yet, our ethical code, the ethical code that we've been taught since we were this big, the ethical code that permeates our entire culture, the entire West, says that self-interest is not a good thing. Even Adam Smith really said that. It's good only in the sense that it serves a social purpose. It serves a, and that's, that's a tough one. You know, your individual behavior is kind of immoral, but continue doing it because it maximizes the utility of society somehow. It's just not convincing. And unless, so I believe that unless we can defend this self-interested action that we engage in in the marketplace, that the marketplace is built upon, we cannot properly, consistently win, uh, win this battle, win this war over freedom. The left, the left holds, you know, the moral high ground. Socialism is consistent with the selfless, pro-self-sacrifice morality that we have been taught for <coughs> hundreds of years. And that we have all bought into subconsciously. It's why guilt is so prevalent, I think, among the wealthy, at least in the United States. Because they know they pursued their own self-interest their whole lives, but that's really not what morality is about. I like to use, you know, Bill Gates was not viewed as a good guy when he made the billions of dollars. What does it take to make somebody a good guy from a moral perspective, from the perspective of ethics? Giving it away. <laughs> so making the money doesn't count morally. Giving it away counts. A morality like that is inconsistent with capitalism. We will never, ever win the battle for capitalism, for freedom, as long as the Bill Gates, the Gateses of the world, are not admired for making the money, for creating the wealth, for pursuing their values, for pursuing profit. So I'm here to defend self-interest. And I'm here to explain self-interest. And the reason self-interest needs to be explained is that it's being perverted, it's being distorted by those who believe that morality is about being selfless, 
by those who believe that morality is about self-sacrifice. Because if they just sold us that package, to, you know, you should be, to be a good person, all you have to do is never think about yourself. Forget about yourself and sacrifice, sacrifice, that pain is good. We'd all say, you've got to be kidding me. I don't want that. But then they say, the only alternative to that, the only alternative to that is being selfish. Now what do we think of when we think of selfishness? When we point to the kid in the schoolyard and say, that kid's selfish. Do we mean he's rationally pursuing his self-interest? No, we mean he's a lying, cheating SOB. <laughs> we mean he's a really horrible person. And nobody wants to be that person. So one of the ways we can sell people on being on a morality of selflessness that nobody really practices is by convincing them that the only alternative is being selfish in this, you know, that Bernie Madoff, everybody know? I, in America, I assume everybody knows who Bernie Madoff, the largest, uh, you know, Ponzi scheme ever, stole $53 billion from investors, and, you know, is it, at least one of his investors committed suicide. His son recently committed suicide out of embarrassment for what his father had done. Um, it, his children actually turned him in. But the idea is that self-interest is Bernie Madoff. If you're truly self-interested, if you're consistently self-interested, then you lie, steal, and cheat, and that's what Bernie Madoff. And nobody, none of us, no good person wants to be Bernie Madoff, so we're stuck in this, you know, in this, there's, there's no way to go, right? Selflessness is, is all they teach. Being selfish is Bernie Madoff. There are no alternatives. So they lump together anti-self-interest crowd, lump together true self-interest, which I'll talk about in a minute, and this viciousness that is a Bernie Madoff, the lying, stealing, cheating, and they present that as a unified concept under the title of self-interest, or selfish, or, or however you want to call it. Greed, you know, greed is a horrible thing, right? We all know that. Why? Because we point to the person who has lied and stolen and cheated in some way, and we say he's greedy. But what about the guy who's being greedy in the sense of just pursuing wealth? But legitimately, just accumulating a lot of wealth. Why is that bad? Why are those two the same? Why is Bill Gates and Bernie Madoff lumped into the same category? And they are. They're both self-interested, at least until Bill Gates gave them money away. <laughs> they have a sense that if Bernie Madoff had stolen all the $53 billion and given it to charity, he would be treated a lot better. <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> but that's perverse. That's the worst. <coughs> so the first thing I want to try to, you know, is I want to separate those two up. I don't believe Bernie Madoff is self-interest. True. He made a lot of money off of his cheating and lying. But when I talk about self-interest, when I talk about self-interest meaning taking care of self, putting self first, wanting to live the best life that you can be, being happy as your primary moral purpose, Bernie Madoff doesn't pop into my mind as that kind of person. Bernie Madoff is a miserable, pathetic human being who lied to everybody he interacted with on a day-to-day -day basis. Because who did he steal from? His best friends, right? people he played golf with, people he interacted with in business. Who did he lie to? Well, he had to hide it from his kids because they were in the business with him. He had to lie to the friends he was stealing the money from. Now put yourself in his place. Imagine living a day where everybody you meet, you have to lie to. Not a happy day. Not pleasant. You know, Bernie Mado, he says in, in, in some of the interviews, he says, you know, that he couldn't sleep at night because he feared being caught. Now, he didn't feel being caught by the police. That was the least of his worries. He worried about being caught by his sons, which is actually what happened, or by his friends. You can't live a happy life. You can't be successful. You can't have self-esteem and self-worth living a life of deception. That's not self-interest. And it's funny to say, yeah, but you made a lot of money, but we're not materialists. We're not just about the money. Money's just one factor in what makes us happy and successful and self-interested and selfish. Right? Money's just one piece of it. He, for the money, gave up everything else. And indeed, it's interesting that most of these guys land up in jail, which is the least happy place on earth. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, while he's in jail, his son commits suicide. I don't think anybody could recover from something like that. That's... So, think of Bernie Madoff as self-destructive. Not a self-interested, not a selfish, but self-destructive. And we need to take that concept of self-interest and rip out the bad guys from it. And then what's left? So what is self-interest about? <clears throat> well, it's about pursuing what's good for me. For each one of us, pursuing what's good for yourself. And what is that? Is that something that's just completely, you know, whatever, subjective, we each have our own values, uh, you know, it's whatever we feel like in the moment. Is that what's going to lead to the best possible life? <coughs> Well, Ayn Rand says no. She says there's a science to human happiness, if you will. There's a science to human success. There's a science to selfishness. There's a science to being good at living. And the challenge, she says, for morality, the challenge for ethics, is to discover the principles by which we should live that lead to a happy, successful life. To so discover the principles by which we should lead, which, which we should live, to achieve a happy and successful life. And there are such principles. You know, so, for example, you know, what is the? There's really, you know, there's one big principle, and then a lot of you can break it out. But what is the one big principle? It's to live a life of what? Well, where do human values come from? You know, if you look at your, if you look at your neighbor, what you see next to you is a weak, pathetic, slow, unfit for nature animal. <laughs> Put yourself into the just watch it. Yeah. <laughs> you wanted me to attack you guys from the right. I'm not sure where that was from, but anyway. <laughs> If you put yourself in the prairies of Africa, you can't compete in just body-wise and material-wise with the cheetahs and the lions and whatever else animals are out there. You, you, we're not strong, we have no fangs, we have no claws. We don't have the ability to just physically survive in the world out there. What is it that allows us to hunt and become, in a sense, the, the king of all the animals, to, to rule over nature? What is it that makes it possible for us to do to create every value that we have? Everything. From the iPhone, to the building, to the electricity, to the clothes we wear and the food we eat. All of them are products of one specific type of human activity. And that activity is reason. It's rational thought. So Rahan says, well, if all human values seem to come from this one thing, then shouldn't that be the most important principle by which one should live, reason, rationality, observing reality, figuring out, coming up with principles based on that. So rationality, reason, that's why rational self-interest, right, to differentiate from you know, the, the, the misinterpretation of self-interest that others would have, it's rational self-interest. <laughs> then the question is, how do we apply reason? How do we apply rationality? to this issue of self-interest. And then you evaluate, is cocaine good for me or not? I feel like I want it, it'll make me feel good, but is it good for me? And is not is it just good for me right now, but is it good for me over the span of my lifetime? And the answer is probably, for most of us, no, it's not. Right? Cocaine's out. Cocaine's not a value to me. It's a negative value because it actually decreases my ability to enjoy life. So, the whole idea is to apply reason to every one of the decisions in life. And that eradicates this notion of a whim worshipping emotion-driven, you know, Bernie Madoff, who, you know, I don't think he sat down and planned his pyramid scheme. He kind of, you know, emotionally just drifted into it because, you know, you cheat once and you cheat a little bit and then it's harder to, it's hard to admit, so you cover it up and then the cover-up is bigger and then you have to have a bigger cover up for the original one. Most of these frauds and these things happen because somebody didn't want to face reality. 
And what is the number one thing you do if you're rational? The, 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 you know, the, the thing that, that uh, the rationality is based upon is the notion of facing reality, facing the facts, accepting the facts. So, rational self-interest is about living a rational life for the purpose of your own happiness, of your own success. Figuring out what that is, and for each one of us, you know, that's going to be somewhat different. But it's not going to be those things that are associated with self-interest and selfishness that, are, that, are, that is blameful. Does that mean we hate other people, right? Because you were selfish, right? So we despise other people, we have nothing to do with other people. We're rude to them, we're impolite. Because all we care about, after all, is ourselves. I mean, it should be obvious that if you rationally analyze it, other people are of huge value to you. We know, right? We know what a free market, how a free market, how division of labor is a huge benefit to us. How the work of other people and trading with other people enriches us enormously. So other people are huge value to oneself. And you never know what kind of value you're getting from other people because you don't know what exactly they're doing in life and in what way they're contributing to yours, but they probably are if they're productive. So other people are enormous value to somebody who's selfish. Uh, so what we need to do is again separate these two out and now if we can defend the idea that self-interest is morality, the other side has claimed that selflessness is morality. And selflessness is incompatible with capitalism. When we go out into the marketplace, we're not being selfless. So if we can establish that selfishness is morality, which is one of Ayn Rand's big missions, then capitalism is self-evident. We don't need I mean, you always need economists, but you don't really need economics. Because what do self-interested people want? If your purpose in life is to pursue your values, if your purpose in life is to pursue your happiness and your success, what is in your self-interest? What are your values? Who can choose that? The only person who can choose that is you. Nobody else knows exactly what you value and what you want and what you care about. Only you can choose it. And therefore, what kind of political system do you want? One that leaves you free to pursue your values. One where coercion is taken out of the picture. Where you are sovereign over your own life, because it's yours, because you're morally certain of your own value, and that you want to live the best life that you can. And there's only one political system that that fits into, and that's a capitalist political system. A political system that leaves you alone. Because what is it that we don't like about other political systems? It's that they coerce you. They coerce you into doing things that, you know, sometimes you might agree with, you might want to do it sometimes, but sometimes you don't agree with it. You want to eliminate coercion altogether. Because coercion <coughs> places a barrier between you and your rational pursuits. So it's this notion of rational self-interest in, in our view, in Ayn Rand's view, in, in the objectivist view, is the ultimate underpinning of a capitalist society. It is the justification, the moral justification of individual freedom. Somebody disagree. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get thunder and lightning, so we <laughs> <pretty safe. laughs> And it's not, in my view, this is not a, um, it's not that hard of a case to make. I know it seems hard, and, you know, I'm not sure I've convinced you guys, but it seems like telling people that they shouldn't feel guilty about pursuing profit, that they shouldn't feel guilty about pursuing their own happiness, about being productive and achieving things, that should be easy. That should be easy. But that is... That's what we're facing. Unless we can make this argument, unless we can convince people to, that their purpose in life is this rational 
self-interested life. I don't see how we can win the battle for freedom and, and win the battle for capitalism. Uh, I think, luckily for us, uh, Rand didn't write philosophy primarily. She wrote novels. Uh, many of you probably read The Fountain and The Atlas Shrugged, uh, which are great vehicles just for that, to get that message uh, to people. And the fact that uh, these books are selling through the roof, uh, better now than, uh, than, way better now than when she was alive, uh, and, and kind of on a continuous, continuously increasing path, suggests that maybe there's a chance that we can get this message out uh, and then capitalize it with, with, uh, with the good economics and the good political theory. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, let me just get a mood, the mood of the meeting. Uh, how many Randians have we got in the audience? Quite a number. Wow. How many? All right, thank you. How many anti-Randians? No, none of those. How many Haikians? Oh, a respectable showing. Freak maniacs? <laughs> oh, a, couple, a couple of those. Yeah, just so you know who you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the maniacs are more you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's not go into home mode. <laughs> uh, I, I, before we just, just before we get on to questions, I mean, uh, there is, uh, you know, a, uh, a human beings are, are a, a social species, and I think you, you sort of said that, but, but there are many uh, cases in which, as, as Hayek, I want, I want, really secretly want to know how many Hayekians there sure, are, I know. <laughs> you know, as Hayek says, um, so much of uh, our social interaction, you know, you think of language and, and, and many other things, they're not planned, they're not designed, they just come out of the fact that we are social creatures and we live together and, and, and we understand that. Uh, now you're talking about, well, let's be rational about this. Now, Hayek would say, that, that I, I don't think he's opposed to you, but, but, but the Hayek, Hayekian view is that um, you know, once you start trying to rationalize things and trying to impose an order on this natural order, uh, then you come a cropper. Sure. Well, the challenge is that, that you rationalize without coercion. That is, um, there is order. There are businesses, corporations that are run where there is order. Um, it's true that you can't centrally plan an entire economy. Um, that's a good thing, but that's not the key argument against central planning. The key argument against central planning is not that it can't be done. Well, we know that. It's just, it's just too complex. But imagine it could be done. Would that be a good thing? No. The problem with central planning is the course of nature of it. That's why it should be rejected. So, yes, much of uh, much, you know, spontaneous order happens, but it happens because, as rational agents, you know, it's the consequence of those interactions of many, many rational agents that we get this added benefit, and that's the benefits of trade. Trade is a win-win. You know, and when you when you trade across an entire economy or trade across an entire society, you get enormous benefits from it. And I think that's a consequence of language. Why did language evolve? I think that it evolved because of exist an existential need between two human beings and then other human beings to communicate, to communicate about trade, about hunting, about survival in some way or another. It evolved because of the selfish need of each individual to communicate for the purpose of survival and then for the purpose of flourishing. You start with survival and then, and then you uh, expand on that. I don't think it's a social, some kind of magic happens uh, in society. I think that if, if we're all self-interested, we're all rational, you get all those benefits of trade on an even larger scale than you do if you, you know, in, in a society that doesn't recognize those virtues. Right, now, who feels a question rising up to their being? You, you were quick. <laughs> <laughs> Dominic, and Matt, can you give us your name and who you are and your claim to fame? Uh, Dominic Graham, uh, Conservative Way Forward, amongst other things. Um, I guess the, the, the question here, and uh, sort of 
following on from uh, Eamon's uh, question is, do you then endorse coercing the rational thought onto people? Because, because you know, the, 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 the natural order or disorder, whatever, if, you know, if people are freely making the choice not to be rational, should they be coerced into it? I think sure. that's, that's the fine oh. distinction there. I think it's pretty easy. I don't think you can coerce people to be rational. That is, rationality is a process that happens inside your head. I can't coerce you to think right. I can coerce the conclusion, but I can't coerce the method. And therefore, no, you would never try to coerce a conclusion because it wouldn't be rational. For the person engaged in it, it's not theirs. Now, I exclude coercion. You cannot have rational thought and coercion are opposites. The thing that negates reason is force. And if we believe in reason, we must demolish force. Force must be extracted from human society. All force. So, for example, I'll give you an example. In, I don't believe that a truly free society has an economic policy. Right. It doesn't have economic policy because the government's not involved in economics. So let's say you're a communist and a committed one, and you have a group of friends who are all communists. If you want to go start a commune somewhere and live your communist way, as long as you're not coercing people who don't who haven't signed on to, I have no problem with that. I, I think you're nuts and crazy and unhappy. <laughs> and all those horrible things, but I can't stop you from doing it. So in that sense, politically, I believe that a, that a free state is neutral philosophically, is neutral economically. It just doesn't get involved. Now I believe, I, I think we all believe that in such a situation capitalism thrives and free markets thrive, and yet there'll be, you know, people start kibbutzes. And as long as they're not subsidized by the government, who cares? I, I'm from Israel, so I know about the kibbutz. And it wouldn't exist without subsidies because it would fail economically. So, but you, you'd have all the freedom in the world to try it. Um, Maybe just Hello, um, I pretty much always regard myself as right wing or centre right, but recently I thought I might use that term anymore because there's so many things about right wing politics, particularly in the UK, that I don't think are at all certainly consistent with my views or, or I think consistent with views of capitalism, for example, being anti abortion, being anti immigration. In America, having this um, quite a lot of religious sure. ideas in, in politics, do you regard objectivism and capitalism as right wing, or do you think the right left spectrum is um, appropriate? You know, ideally, I think it is right wing because I, I think it's right. I think they're not right, right? <laughs> <laughs> but given, given that they have adopted the rights, uh, I, I, I don't think that it's useful to use that spectrum. Uh, that is, the risk that we run is to be associated, particularly in America, where the religious right is so dominant, to be associated with those views. You know, it's a, it's a challenge uh, that we face uh, all the time. You know, do you go on the Glenn Beck show or don't you? Right? I don't know if you know Glenn Beck, but I assume everybody knows him. But, he, you know, he's very good on certain issues. I mean, brilliant on some things. But then he's wacky, complete nutcase on others. And y you have to be very cautious not to be associated with the... Uh, you know, anti-evolution, uh, you know, anti-abortion, all those views which the religious right in the United States is, is very big on. And they're not really for capitalism either, right? They're, they're for some mushy, you know, uh, compromised vision of, of what markets are really about. So you have to be very careful. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, Sam, and then we'll move forward here and then we'll do this talk, right? Oh. Um, yeah, you talked about kind of happiness being the goal. Um, it's obviously completely different for every person. Now. Yeah probably synonymous with utility. Uh, you're kind of saying people should maximize their utility. So isn't that kind of a tautology? Isn't it like saying that you should act? Because what kind of act can there be that isn't by definition utility maximizing? And so there, I mean, I'm, I, I just, I'm confused about sure. how it's different from just simply acting. No, this is the classic uh, question I get from economists who've been trained in utility theory. And <laughs> He's been reading his Mises. Yes. <laughs> I don't accept that we're utility maximizers. I don't believe people are utility maximizers. They can be. I don't think most people are. I think most people go through life doing... Uh, uh, take the cocaine example. Um, there are plenty of people who snort the cocaine. It's not utility maximizing. It might be pleasure maximizing at the moment, but it's not utility maximizing in the, in the long-term rational sense of that. It doesn't increase their happiness. It increases their misery. 
And I think most people, most people act every day, lots and lots of times a day, to increase their misery index, to minimize their utility. I think this is where economists are wrong, and, and particularly the Austrians, because they take economics and they apply it, they take the idea of utility and the idea of rational behavior, and then they say, well, everybody does it all the time. Well, but that's simply not true. People do self-destructive, harmful things to themselves that if they just stopped for a second and thought about it, they'd know they were something, but they don't stop the second to think about it. We're not deterministic. There's no mechanism within us that drives us to pursue our self-interest. We can be self-interested, but we can also be self-destructive, and we can also be selfless. We can also, like some people in Mexico have seen, nail ourselves to the cross to sympathize with Jesus, just to feel the pain. That's not utility maximizing. <laughs> <laughs> they might think it is, because in the emotion of the moment, you know, they, 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 got, they got the ecstasy. But there's nothing objectively, scientifically, and this is why I emphasize, this is a science. If you, if you, if you evaluate scientifically human life, nailing yourself to a cross is not utility maximizing. There are certain scientific principles that say this action leads to happiness, this action leads to death. If you do too much cocaine, it's the death. Those are scientific principles. If you eat certain amounts of poison, you will die. People choose to eat that poison in spite of that. Because they're self-destructive, because they're not utility maximized, because the, 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 the idea of taking economics and applying it to all of human action is wrong. This is a big disagreement between von Mises and, and Ayn. Ayn Rand, they, they used to have dinner. I'd love to have had a mic there. Oh, you know, Hazlitt, von Mises, and Ayn Rand sitting around the dinner table and discussing these kind of issues. But this was the core of their disagreement. The idea that you can take these principles of economics and apply it versus having philosophy. Philosophy is a field. And people take philosophical ideas that are bad for them and they commit it to them. And yet, they're never going to be happy because of it. Because they've made bad choices. Yeah. Just there. Can you say anything on? Hi, my name is Andrew Bates. I'm a uh, student of objectivism from New Zealand and um, a former spokesman for the Libertarians Party in New Zealand, which is not as broad brush and broad tent as the US Libertarian yes. Party. It's um, started by objectivists, for objectivism, and promotion of objectivist ideas, and now pretty much abandoned by objectivists. Um, <laughs> we. The question is what politically should an objectivist in the UK do? You've got the Conservatives who are run by um, a smarmy pragmatist <coughs> who's not very far apart from a socialist. Um, then you've got UKIP who, um, make, who make some good noises about Europe and sound money occasionally but then do want, want to do things that like uh, abridging freedom of expression such as uh, banning burqas. And then you've got a, a small uh, libertarian party which is all over the, all over the shop. Um, all over the shop as the US Libertarian Party. So what yeah. what should an objectivist in New Zealand, uh, sorry, in the UK? <laughs> I'm glad you're not asking about New Zealand, which I know nothing about. So what should an objectivist in the UK do? I, I, I don't think much would be my answer. I, I don't think politics matters at this point. Uh, I don't think we have enough objectivists to make any difference. Uh, and I don't think politics is where change is going to come from. I would vote, in terms of voting, because that's a one political action, I would vote to minimize damage and give us more time. So figure out how to strategically vote so that you get, so freedom of speech is kept around, so you have enough time to try to convince people to vote for the party of the future which will be more objectivist or more, you know, libertarian in the, in the, in the non-rough body in sense. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say good sense, but I think those are the same. Um, so, so in, in, you know, I think it's, it's, it's buying time, and that's my view of the U.S. I will vote Republican, I will sometimes vote Democratic, but it's all an issue of how do you buy time, because, you know, the fact is that, you know, we're not nowhere near to turning the corner. Uh, I, I think we better turn the corner in the next 10, 20 years, because I think the, 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 the U.S. economy, at least, something I know about, is, is in dire straits, and, and uh, if we don't turn the corner in the next 10, 20 years, you know, this economic crisis would feel like nothing as compared to what's coming. But at least turn the corner. I'm not saying get there, but turn the corner. But you need that time. You need to buy the time. And, and if the Republicans can slow down the growth of statism, vote Republican. But maybe it's divided government that slows down the growth of statism, as the Bush administration proved that it does, didn't slow anything down. Maybe having divided government is the best. So you have to strategically think about what is the best way just to slow it down so that you buy yourself time. 
Nick or I don't think I have any claim to Spain, so I wouldn't make one. But um, I know you, you, one, rejected the left-right spectrum pretty much. I know Eamon also said that you were going to try to attack the Adam Smith Institute from the right. <laughs> I was wondering if I could attack you from the right. Sure. And you've insisted that coercion must be banished from all human relationships. Yes. Right. I've, I've heard you say, you know, on, on the internet, on YouTube, and that kind of thing on television, you, you know, you reject the the Rothbardian model, the anarcho-capitalist yes. model. Um, how do you how do you square those two values? I mean, what would a what would an objectivist state? Because I assume there has to be a state, there has to be sure. a government. Sure. What would it look like? without coercive taxation paid for it? That's, that's really my question. Oh, why is so that not, why is that not you're you're minimizing. Party and, you know, well, I mean, my difference with, with anarchists, anarchism, uh, at least those who are Bardians who believe in anarchism, is I don't believe you can have over, overlapping jurisdictions which have the ability to use force. That is, I don't think you can have competing police forces. I think it's ludicrous. And it only leads to, ultimately, to dictatorship. You know, the biggest guy you know, the guy with the biggest police force and the most powerful weapons is going to destroy all the other ones and take it over. So, you know, I, I just... Anarchy doesn't work. Now, how do you fund a, a state that has a police force and has a military uh, and has a judiciary system, which is the objectivist uh, model state? You fund it uh, primarily, and, and there might be other ways to fund it, and we're a long way from solving that problem, but primarily through voluntary taxation. Um, I see no problem. I see no issue with with leaving it up to people to pay for their defense and to pay for their policing voluntarily. Uh, people do lots of things voluntarily today that they don't have to do. They, you know, not to say I'm not even mentioning charity, but this is in their self-interest. I want there to be a police force. I certainly want a military to protect my borders, particularly in times where they might be invaded and times where they, you know, that are more peaceful. They probably cut the amount of money I gave for that cost, but. Explain to people why it's in their rational self-interest to support a police and a military and to support the judiciary. I don't think that's hard to do. And then the judiciary can then also, you can have fees on, on, um, on protecting contracts, you can have fees on patents and things like that. Um, so there's certain fees that the government can charge for specific services, but then policing and military, I think, could be voluntary. And, you know, yes, it, there's going to be a free rider problem. Who the hell cares? It's my view. I mean, so there'll be some free riders. As long as there's enough police and enough military to protect me, and I'm writing the checks I feel good about myself, and if my neighbor is not contributing anything to his own policing and his own defense, I'll, I won't speak to him, I won't trade with him, I'll boycott him. And I think all the neighbors should. So, I mean, there are mechanisms by which that is dealt with, but it has to be voluntary. It cannot be coerced. My name is uh, Devika. About what you spoke spoke about earlier about being, you know, you basically talked about selfish. Yes. Being selfish is good. Yes. And you also then link that to saying, you know, being selfish probably means that other people are valued to you, which kind of contradicts the definition of being selfish, which means showing disregard for others. No, okay. I, don't, I don't think that. You see, that's that's the definition that the selfless morality would like you to believe in. But I don't think that's the definition. The definition of selfish is taking care of self is placing your own well-being above the well-being of others. That doesn't mean you don't care for other people. It just means you care for them in the context of your own life. So I care for my kids more, for example, than I care for your kids. I, now that I've met you, I probably care for your kids more than I care for some child in Africa. So what's close to me, I'm going to care more about. Uh, what I love, I'm going to care much more about. Uh, people I trade with on a day-to-day -day basis, the grosser, the, you know, the, the butcher, to, to use that as, I'm going to care more about them because I actually see the benefit I'm getting than somebody far distance from me. But it does, I still care about people because my life depends on them. My life is better for their existence. Okay, I think I was going to pick up on the point when you said yes. the word probably. Um, no, it wouldn't be probably. Okay. I probably was a uh, rhetorical point. Okay. It's absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely people are valued to you. Okay. There's no question about I, I have, you know, contradictions in, in the sense that, you know, being selfish means just looking after one's own self-interest. Um, and then you link it to, you know, you know, uh, making other people value to you. And I was going to go on to the point where I wanted your views on, it's an extreme subject, I know, sure. but like on exploitation. Now, when you're doing business, um, and if you're selfish, then you think about one's own profit, and yes. that's all that matters to you at any cost, yes. sort of.
thing. But think so of what it, are the views on economic but, exploitation? But, but, and things well, like that. think about that. So all I care about is profits. I, I used to do this to you know we used to I used to um, uh, teach finance. Uh, so we have a big issue in finance is should companies maximize shareholders or should they be stakeholder friendly? Right? They care about everybody and the workers and everybody on the planet. <laughs> and we used to list all the stakeholders and then we take a decision like moving a plant to Mexico or something. And how do you make a decision? Well, this one it's plus for them and then it's minus and you kind of weigh all these and you can't weigh them because it's all algorithm. So basically it's whoever has the biggest voices, whoever pounds on your door more, you get. And then I go to the shareholders and I say, all I care about is shareholders. I really only want to maximize profit because that's what shareholders care about. So what do I do? I take my employees and I chain them to their machines and I whip them three times a day. <laughs> and my students will go, well, well, wait, but, but then they won't work hard and they won't get the maximum productivity for them. Oh, okay, so if I maximize profit, it means I need to treat my employees pretty well because I need them to be maximally productive. Cause that, but, but supplies, I don't care about supplies, right? So I, I'm late on the bills, I never pay them. No, 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 you can't do that because if, 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 if you really care about profits, your suppliers have to trust you because you want them to deliver the goods when you're... And you can extrapolate that on and on. The fact is that, a, that if you want to be profitable, then you have to take care of your people. Any businessman will tell you that. Now, the term exploitation, on the other hand, is, uh, I think has been uh, broadened uh, to such an extent that I think it's become almost meaningless. Uh, I, I consider exploitation chaining to the machines and the whipping. I don't consider exploitation going into uh, Indonesia or Malaysia or you know many other countries and, and hiring 12 year olds to work. I think you're adding enormous value to that 12 year old into that uh, into that culture. Uh, there's no accident that Britain during and, you know I am in England to so correct me if I'm wrong, but during the Industrial Revolution they had child labor, and the option was what. If you didn't have child labor, they passed a law in the early 19th century not to have child labor. What would those children have done? Well, many of them would have stopped. And that's exactly what's going on in Malaysia and Indonesia. And their marginal value, <coughs> if you pay them a buck a day or whatever their going rate is, that going rate is higher than, their, than what they alternatively would have done, which is what did children do before the Industrial Revolution? Work 14 hour days on the farm and barely survive. <coughs> Subsistence, and most have died because there wasn't enough food and the conditions weren't... And the Industrial Revolution made it possible for us to educate our kids and to pamper them and spoil them and all the things we do to our kids today. Without going through that phase, we would have never achieved the wealth to make it possible for us to treat children differently. Indonesia, Malaysia, all these other countries have to go through the same stage. There's no way to skip over it. They have to create the capital to make it possible for them to reach the amount of wealth so that children won't have to work. None of us want children to work but you're benefiting them by providing jobs at this stage in their development. I got this person on the extreme right here. Oh, extreme? <laughs> well, technically I think I'm extreme left on this room, but, uh, <laughs> but don't worry, I, I'm no commie, don't worry. Um, basically, I was just wondering, because uh, like if you look at the economic policy of like Britain and, and America, and like the West generally, especially with uh, uh, you know, back of Obama in charge, uh, it seems like that they're specifically following policies that will destroy wealth, uh, that will inflate the currency, and uh, and that will cause people to to die basically. And uh, you know you'd have to be a complete cretin to not really understand like how that that economic policy is is going to cause inflation and stuff. So so why do they do it? I mean. <laughs> Um, politicians fine. Well, because, because there's n they don't see an option. Their worldview is constrained by the idea that the only solutions emanate from government. There, there is no solution. If you let the market free, things will be much, 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 much worse. So, yes, there are problems with what we do, but we're really, really smart and we'll figure them out. So Bernanke, I think to some extent, I think he's self-deceiving, but to some extent believes that he'll be able to squeeze all that extra money out just in time so that there's no inflation. Although anybody who studied economics knows that that's absurd. But he, he, he believes that what's his option? His option is not to print money and to just let things get worse in the short run, but politically that's infeasible and people will be hurting and he really cares about people. I mean, where does he go with that? Freedom is not on the table. It's not an option for them. 
their whole mindset, the whole way they think. You know, think about uh, October 2008. You know, Lehman had just gone bankrupt. Financial world is is in chaos. Uh, was anybody putting on the table, let's do nothing? I mean, <laughs> that's not in their world view. Their world view is we have to do something. It's what we get paid for. It's it's what politicians are about. And if you had told them, but yeah, but long term, it'll make things worse, they would have said, how do you know that? Long term, who knows what the long term will bring? Who knows what will happen? You know, we got to solve this problem right now, whatever the long term is, it is. But we can't tell, we don't know. And in that sense, people are driven by the underlying premises. They're not driven by economics. You know, Bernanke should know better, right? He's a brilliant economist from Princeton, so is Krugman. Right. They should know better, but they don't, because economics doesn't matter to them. What matters are these more fundamental premises. All right, we'll go to the extreme uh, left here, all right. Uh, during your description of child labor, you said basically the kids in Malaysia and uh, Indonesia with these other two years. It was exploitation, uh, exploitation what you said. You said they either work or they die. Yeah. So how, how, how morally... Well, how e ex exploitation I would view as I kill them, right? Uh, so they either work for me, or I whip them, or, or shoot them. That would be exploitation. I'm using coercion, you know, to get them into my factory and keep them there. The reality is, if I don't bring my factory there, they die. That's just the reality. Or they live very, very poor lives, on less than a dollar a day. By bringing the factory there, I raise their standard of living from near death to a dollar a day. Which is not great, but it sure beats the half dollar a day. So, it, it, there's no coercion there. They, and the other aspect, again, is moral. The fact that somebody's dying somewhere does not place a claim on me. I don't owe them anything. I don't owe the child in Malaysia anything other than not to make him worse off through force. But if I'm being a factory there, I'm increasing the choices. That's all I'm doing. I'm not forcing him to walk in. I'm increasing the set of choices that that child has. And that can be a negative thing. But does he really have a choice? Is there a choice? Sure. How is the sure. He can stay on the farm. If, if I don't bring the factory there, what happens? That's the alternative choice. Should I have a choice? You always have a choice. Yeah, but there's only one rational choice, which is what you said. You have to use uh, rationality. Well, then great, then I'm providing it. But again, if I don't bring the factory there, then there's no. Then, then the only rational choice is to stay uh, on so the verge of starvation. But there is no choice. Of course there's a choice. If it's well, always a choice. Right. This is best decided outside by three four three submissions or something. Dr. Receiver. Yeah. 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 Moral philosophy in the UK and to some extent in the US. I'm going to make two statements which um, people in the UK would generally consider to be incompatible, and even some people in this room might consider them to be incompatible. The first is this I consider myself to be an honest and moral trader, and the second is I'm a private doctor. <laughs> I put those two together. They make complete sense. <laughs> to use, yes, but not in the UK. And I don't know how to be able to resolve our economic or philosophical or um, political problems until we do look at that. But, it, but I, I agree with you, but to me that is a moral economic issue. That is the notion that people view private and moral as somehow in conflict is a problem with morality. It's not a problem with private. So my challenge is, we need to rethink morality, because something's screwy in the way people view morality if they view a private doctor as somehow immoral. So the challenge to us is not economic, it's not political, it's moral. How do we convince people that morality is about being a trader? That the trade principle, that the idea behind trade is the essential idea in morality. It's about, you know, you're providing a service, but you're seeking your own a value from it. You're not doing it out of, you know, out of coercion, and you're not doing it just for the benefit of mankind. You're doing it for your benefit as well, and that's a good thing. That's what we need to convince them. So I, I agree completely. And who else feels 
How about the questions on morality? Yeah. Since this was, yeah, this is going to be about morality. We can, you can talk. There are better people in economics in the room. Right. Who wants to talk about morality? Right. Well, right at the very back there. Mark Bailey, a member of the ASI. Um, moral perversion you mentioned at the beginning, and so Stephen brings up definitions and selfishness means harming others, or taking from you. I hate to be uh, fair to the left, but uh, to be fair to the left, <laughs> it's uh, much, much older. It's uh, from nearly all the major religions. Absolutely. That's why this is such a big challenge. I said it's hundreds of years old. This is, this is you know, again, this goes back to um, mo mostly to, Chris to Christianity. I mean, because the Greeks, the Greeks would have never, even Plato, would have never considered morality uh, as something selfless. Morality was always about self-improvement. Morality was about making yourself the best. And, and Aristotle certainly, the goal of morality is, the goal of life is you diminea, you know, fulfillment, happiness, however you translate that. But it was about, it was about egoism. It, you know, Aristotle is an egoist. He's about how do I make my life the most fulfilling life possible. Western civilization, I think with Christianity, but it has its roots in Judaism and elsewhere, distorts that. And, and, and uh, in order to advocate for its selflessness, <coughs> full self-sacrifice morality, it colors selfishness with all this darkness. And that's why this is such a hard battle. If it was just about economics, we would have won a long time ago. This is about challenging the most sacred beliefs that people have and have had for the last 2,000 years. Anybody else on morality? Right, well, I'll take a couple at a time. Uh, just there, and then, and then you. Yeah. Right, so my name is Jan, and I guess I represent the uh, Polish Economy Research Institute. I hope this question is about morality. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I know Ayn Rand would, uh, you know, um, be very much against initiation of violence, and you mentioned that before, yeah. as you know. Uh, how does, th does this principle follow directly from um, rational selfishness? It follows directly from um, the idea that reason is man's means of survival. That is, that our, our tool for survival is a, a thinking mind, is rationality, is rational thought. And the only thing that can stop thinking, that can stop the application of reason, is coercive force. So that's why she's against force. Because it's the antithesis. It's the anti-reason, the anti-rationality. Thought and force are opposites. And if you believe in thought, if you believe in reason, if you believe in rational argument and rational discussion, convincing people through reason, then force takes that away. Right? You have to do what the guy with the gun says, whether you think it's good or whether you think it's bad. It's out. So what if I apply force to something? It's the same thing. It, you're, you're, you know, if, if, reason, if reason is a universal value, it's not just a value to you, it's a value to everybody, and you cannot benefit, Rand would say, and I'd agree, you cannot benefit from applying force to somebody else. You suffer as well as they do. And it goes back to the fact that we benefit when we trade. We benefit when it's a win-win. You can't benefit from coercion, whether it's a gun, or whether it's fraud, or whether it's lying and cheating, you're deceiving yourself, you're deceiving reality, you're destroying your capacity to reason. And as a consequence, you suffer. You will now be successful. Yeah, and there was that second yeah. question. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, my name is Bjorn. I'm from Sweden, so it's basically summer here now. I thought it was in Australia, but apparently it's also in London. Anyway, um, I've been very involved in uh, Swedish politics, and uh, especially in uh, politics regarding the school. And I, uh, since you said we're losing the battle in, we're losing the moral battle, and I'd say that um, <coughs> we're actually losing it, the battle already in kindergarten or in school. Let's sure. say that uh, I'm going to my first. It's my first day in school. I'm six years old. And I have just uh, went to uh, Toys R Us or some toy store and bought a really nice uh, Barbie uh, backpack that I really enjoy. It's very, it's pink. It's very girlish. It has ponies on it, but I love it, even if I'm a guy. And I'm not. Yeah, never mind my. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, that, the thing is that, um, all the other boys are wearing some sort of Spider-Man backpacks, so I am quite unique in that sense. And therefore they bully me because I am not as everyone else. And since no one really interferes at that moment, 
Uh, as a six-year-old, I'm being taught that I should be as everyone else. And since you said we shouldn't interfere with politics, and you should say that we should, but you're still saying that we should act now, but we shouldn't interfere in politics, but in the future, when we've bought time, sure. we have all, so let's say that we're ruling Britain, but we should still not interfere with politics. So what should we do to prevent well, we this should from happening? We, we, should, we should get involved in education. I don't think you're going to change bullying from the political, from, from politics. You change bullying by changing the culture in the schools and by changing, parent, by changing parenting skills, because a lot of the bullying you know, a lot of times the parent of the kid, of the boy with the with the pink thing or whatever, are, are going to be pretty upset. You know, are going to side with the guys with the Spider-Man. So it's about it's about changing parents' attitudes and about changing schools. I think the biggest campaign, the most important campaign that we could engage in long term is to change the schools. And I think the fundamental change that needs to happen is to privatize them, is to get the government out of the schools altogether and let competition reign and let the free market really you know, establish itself. And that's why I criticize a lot of the think tanks in the U.S. for wanting charter schools and vouchers and tax credit. That's all nonsense. You want the government out completely. And the schools are so bad in the United States that if ever there was a time where you could actually advocate for selling the schools and privatizing all, now's the time because people are upset with the schools. So let's go all the way. Let's not go halfway. Let's, you know, raise money by selling off the schools. There's a way to cut California's budget deficit. <laughs> Sell all of the schools. But you, we, we've got, I mean, it, it, you're right. It starts, I mean, in, in America, you walk into the classroom and there's your lesson about how man is destroying the environment and is evil for industrialization. And it starts when they're four or five years old and they get it every single year in the classrooms. And if we don't start combating at those young ages, we're a huge deficit. You know, one of the things we do at the Institute is we try to get, at least in high schools and middle schools, we try to get Ayn Rand read. And we've been very successful in getting the books into classrooms and getting them part of the curriculum, which I think at least gives the older kids options. At least they're exposed to something different. Um, our time is limited, so who's <coughs> the first thing to ask the question? Who thinks they would explode? I'll try to give short, <laughs> short answers. Well, let's start uh, just from right at the very back there. Yeah. Hi there, a question linking uh, morality and selfishness. I They're the same thing, by the way. Yeah. They are, well, this is it. Very, very thought-provoking. I wanted to disagree with you fairly sure. soon on and find myself agreeing with you more and more as you, as you continue. Um, but could you argue if everybody is intrinsically selfish, which, or at least they're trying to maximize their perceived utility, could you argue that that is completely in line with being entirely selfless? if your own utility function is a function of somebody else's utility function, yeah. for example, a mother, child, somebody dying for a friend, et cetera, et cetera. See, again, I, I don't believe that people are utility maximizers. I don't think they're in, in, intrinsically, or, or even perceived, I don't think they are. I, I think people are guided by moral principles, and if they believe that helping somebody else, even though it'll, it'll bring them disastrous consequences, if they think it's the right thing, not the good thing for them, but just the right thing. They do it. And it, but they're not thinking, I'll feel better if I help this friend. I'll feel better if I die for this friend, because you can't feel better once you're dead. Um, <laughs> they're thinking, this is the right thing, because the priest and my philosopher and everybody has told me since I was this age that the other person's well-being is what's good for me. So I, 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 that is not utility maximizing. Um, now, that is not to say that you don't help a friend and that there aren't circumstances where you do risk your life for somebody. But that is only moral, in my view. It's only moral when it is rational. That is, when in your hierarchy of values that person is so important that risking your life for them is necessary necessary for your well-being. And you can imagine a child, a wife, you know, but a stranger, you know, I think last time, last time I spoke to Erasmus, somebody asked me a cool question about a child drowning in a, in a river, and do you jump in and help him? I, my answer is it depends. It depends, is it my child? Um, it depends how rough the river is. Can I swim? <laughs> can I swim? 
it, it depends on, on two factors. What value that child has to me. Now, any child, even a straight child, has some value to me. And then, correspondingly, what is my probability of surviving? But if the probability of my surviving is close to 100%, a child is a value, and I'm willing to jump in and save a child, you know, in spite of the hassle and getting wet, because life <laughs> is valuable. But that's, that's the trade-off, I mean, that's the calculation, the rational calculation that you have to go through. It's what value is it to me? But Smith says it, it's not a matter of rational calculation, no. it's in your nature. Yes. Well, I don't think it is. Many people see drowning kids and don't jump in. So, Smith and I would disagree. <laughs> you won't be invited back. <laughs> I've got two questions. I want people who are going to be really honorary and ask really nasty questions and disagree, right? I've got an endless choice here. I'm going to take... Uh, yeah, I'm going to take uh, you there and then... And then uh, just, just in support of what you think you've been saying here, so I disagree. I was talking to a, an, an IT consultant who, was, who had done work for Homeland Security, and uh, he, he was pretty familiar with the, uh, with the setup there. And he said that uh, Homeland Security chief, if he was ever to be kidnapped, ambushed and kidnapped. His security was in charge of killing him because what he could possibly uh, pass on to, uh, sure. to, to third parties would be, uh, would be very damaging to the security of millions of Americans. Sure. And he, as Chief of Homeland Security, was quite happy to perform the task and be aware that he would be killed under, under such circumstances. And that, and that is totally um, uh, rational, as, as, well, as, as, you, as you described. Uh, I, think it can be, I think it can be rational, but it doesn't have to be. So imagine, imagine if the United States wasn't a good country. Now, I think it's still a good country, but imagine it wasn't. It was a nasty country. I wouldn't want to die for it. <laughs> they can have all the secrets in the world. I'm not going to die for, for a really bad country. So, to evaluate whether it's a rational decision or not, I would want to know, why does he love America? If he loves America just because he was born there, I don't consider that a rational decision. But if he loves America for real values, for the, you know, the freedom and whatever, then I'd say, okay, then it's worth fighting for. In a sense, it's the same choice a soldier makes. You'd say, is a soldier selfish or not? I say yes, if he's writing for the right, for the right reasons. But no, I think a lot of soldiers are not there for the right reasons. They're there for a false sense of patriotism. They're there because it's emotional. And in that case, they're not being selfish and they're not being utility maximizers and they're bad. Right at the back. Uh, yeah, I just wondered if someone uses um, force against you, yeah. how and who decides on the rational punishments or consequences that they preserve? Government. I think that's exactly the only role, one of the only roles the government has. I think that, that uh, the whole purpose of government is to come up with a rational means of settling disputes. Uh, with it, because otherwise it is left up to, you know, vigilante, uh, vigilante justice. Uh, I think the police and, and, and government, the whole purpose of it is to objectify uh, objectify the resolution of disputes like that and to use force in retaliation when necessary. That's it. That's the role of government. So even if the victims themselves, you believe, um, you know, have acted in their own way, does not agree with the punishment that... Uh, yes. Uh, no, I, I mean, again, if somebody's coming out with a knife, I'm not going to say, well, I don't have to do anything because, you know, only the police can use force. I'm going to shoot the bastard, and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it later, right? But I'm going to have to justify my actions, and I think legitimately so, to the police, to, to the government, and I, because I think the government has the monopoly over force. That's the whole purpose of it. What if both parties in that situation say, want to solve their issue through Sharia law? Do you have any justification to stop them doing that? As long as it's voluntary, no. If both parties want, but once once one party says, wait a minute, I don't like Sharia law, then no. 
then no. Then again, you have, it's just like if you have a corporate dispute, you can certainly write into the contract that you first have arbitration, and absolutely, arbitrate private arbitration and private judicial processes are fine as long as they're voluntary, as long as everybody consents to them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's um, terribly irrational uh, for you, but, uh, but we do have a drink outside. I know it's not in your own best interest. But, uh, uh, there you are. If you, if you want to give in, uh, we will have a drink for you uh, outside. Uh, we have to close the formal parts of the uh, proceeding. Yaron will, will be around for a little while if anybody likes to ask him um, other questions. I think it's been an absolutely uh, uh, sensational, uh, scintillating session. Uh, so thank you all who have asked the uh, questions and participated for that, and thanks in particular to, to Yaron. And uh, just uh, to uh, keep Adam Smith a little Please closer to your heart, it's Adam Smith's time. <laughs>